Welcome to the Department of Healthcare Services training for the new facility site and medical record review tools and standards. These updates are to be released following the end of the public health emergency. This training has been a collaborative effort throughout all the Medi-Cal managed care plans in California. A special thank you to all the participating plans who made this training possible. The new standards discussed in this video are replacing the currently used guidelines from 2012 and is governed by the All Plan Letter or APL 20-006. In this video, we will be discussing changes to the facility site review portion of the tool. The next video will discuss changes to the medical records review tool. DHCS has mandated the plans to educate their respective primary care network to those new standards. It is required for all network providers to be aware of the standards for a successful facility site review process. Be aware that your managed care plans referred to in this video as MCPs may require an attestation of completion of this course. Your MCPs are always on your side for success and will welcome any questions following this training. In this training, we will cover the six sections of the facility site review tool. We will explain changes to the timelines for corrective action plans. We will explain the monitoring process, how to remain in the MCP network, and what happened to the provider appeals process and an informative section of Did You Know? Lastly, a quick update on COVID-19 as it pertains to APL 20-011. Let's get started with the first section of the tool called Access and Safety. Clinic settings with more than 10 employees must install and maintain an employee alarm system with distinctive sounds to warn employees anywhere in the clinic of an emergency. Adequate warning is the key to safety of your employees. For clinic settings with 10 employees or less, direct voice communication is acceptable provided all employees present can hear the voice communication. A policy will be required stating your clinic's emergency protocols. There are changes to the airway management section. Oral airways have been removed from the emergency medication and equipment setup. The standard states, various sizes of airway devices appropriate to patient population within the practice are on site. To clarify, the reference statement refers to the sizes of masks needed to administer oxygen or the use of an Ambu bag. A bulb syringe for pediatric offices is now mandatory for your emergency kit. Specific medications have been added based on patient population. The new standards requiring adding naloxone, 81 milligrams of chewable aspirin, nitroglycerin spray or tablets, bronchodilator medications such as a metered dose inhaler or solution for a nebulizer and glucose. If your clinic is using the bronchodilator solution, make sure a nebulizer is with your emergency equipment. As always, have appropriate sizes of safety needles with syringes and alcohol wipes for a quick and safe administration of injectable medication. The next section of the tool and standards is personnel. In this section, we will discuss four changes. For trained medical assistants who administer any type of medications or solutions by way of subcutaneous, intramuscular, or intradermal, which also includes venipuncture or skin puncture to withdraw blood, your practice must have a policy explaining that. Prior to administration, the MA must show the medication vial along with the filled syringe and the member's name to a licensed healthcare provider LVN or above. The MA must also confirm the correct patient, medication, route, and dosage prior to the administration. There are educational requirements for an MA to administer any medications. The MA certification requirements are listed here. If an MA has not been formally trained, a licensed provider may certify an MA that meets these requirements. Contact your MCP for a certification letter. Provide a policy identifying what medications are being pre-authorized by the supervising physician for the MA to administer in your practice. Authorization means a specific or standing order to prepare medications described by the supervising physician. At no times may an MA administer any medication in any form to a member without a supervising provider on site at the time of administration. As of October 2019, 
Senate Bill 697 changed terms for physician assistance from a delegation of service agreement to a practice agreement. The requirement to identify the supervising physician in each progress note has been removed. If your practice has not changed to the new practice agreement, the terms of the existing service agreement must be followed until a new practice agreement is in place and signed by the PA and supervising physician. No changes were made to the nurse practitioners and certified nurse midwives by the Board of Registered Nursing, BRN. A supervising physician may supervise up to four PAs and four furnishing NPs on any given shift. NPs that are not furnishing are unlimited on any given shift. Here is the explanation for the new cultural and linguistics requirements. When a limited English proficient member is being treated at your facility, interpretive services must be offered. Each healthcare organization or HCO in California offers interpreter services for their entire network. Please provide signage for members to be notified that this service is offered in your healthcare setting. The signage must be in the member's preferred language, notifying them of this service and how to obtain it. The signage may be in the lobby, exam rooms, or handout provided to the member. If a staff member is providing interpretation of medical information, their competency level must be verified in that language by an outside professional vendor or company. Alternatively, a physician fluent or proficient in the same language may document the staff member's medical terminology proficiency. A policy must be present explaining such procedures. In this section of office management, there is only one change. Medical records retention standards are currently seven years and have been changed to 10 years for all members regardless of age. Records shall be retained for 10 years after the member's last visit. If records are jacketed paper records and are not going to be housed in the physical service location, the retention facility must be secured for medical purposes. Records are not to be stored in a personal home, domestic storage units such as you store it, U-Haul storage units, storage pods, or alike. If records are destroyed after 10 years, it must be in a safe, approved manner for medical shredding. If a service location has been damaged due to fire, flood, or other disaster, the service location must notify the MCP immediately for guidance for record security. Clinical and Pharmaceutical Services in this section, you will see significant changes. We will start with dispensing of samples or over-the-counter medications. If your service location is dispensing samples or over-the-counter medications, the procedures are as follows. There must be a policy and procedure that includes labeling of the medication packaging that is being dispensed, manufacturer, name of medication, strength of the medications, instructions of use, quantity in the container, and duration of treatment, including the expiration date. The member's chart must have documentation of the same components. Clinics must keep a log of sample medications given to members in the event of a recall, as well as an inventory log of medications available to be dispensed. The guidelines for refrigerators and freezers have been clarified. No service location can use dormitory style or bar style combination for medication storage. All temperature regulated units must have a do not disconnect label on the power supply and avoid using a power strip with an on off switch that could be accidentally turned off. Biologics that are stored in the cooling units must be separated from the medications. This can be achieved by using a sealed plastic container, plastic bags that zip closed, or other separating material. Biologics can also be kept in slide-out bins at the bottom of the cooling unit if your unit has this feature. At no time may personal food or beverage be stored with medications or biological cooling storage units. For pediatric service locations who have VFC, please follow the VFC requirements. For food items that are medicinal, such as medicated frozen pops or popsicles used for children, these can be kept in medication freezers. Additionally, ice packs used for medication transport in the event of a power outage 
or ice packs used for blood or fluid transport to a lab may be kept in a freezer. This is an example of a dormitory or bar-style cooling system that is not allowed in any circumstance. Here we see an example of a two-door cooling unit that is compact and acceptable for location and services adult members. These do not have to be purchased from a medical supply or certified medical grade units. For a pediatric practice who store and administer VFC vaccines, please consult VFC and follow those guidelines. The standards further states to attach a sign to the power cord labeled such as do not disconnect or do not unplug. Do not use power strips with an on-off switch. The new standards address a possible power outage or malfunction in your cooling units and how to handle those emergencies in hopes to avoid costly waste of medications. Have a written policy procedure to include the plan to protect the vaccines in the event of a power outage or out-of-range temperature readings. Acceptable procedures including contacting vaccines for children or the manufacturer. A consultation with the CDC is also available when necessary. It is important to quarantine the vaccines until guidance is obtained. Action must be taken when temperatures are identified outside the recommended range. Please note that the refrigerator must be maintained between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius or 36 degrees to 46 degrees Fahrenheit, while the freezer is minus 15 degrees Celsius or 5 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. Site personnel must be able to verbalize the procedures in a written plan to promptly respond to out-of-range temperatures and to protect the vaccines in case of a power outage or malfunction of the units. These procedures should include both refrigerator and freezers. For VFC providers, it is important that you follow the program requirements for documentation and reporting. CDC recommends that every vaccine storage unit must have a temperature measuring device. An accurate temperature history that reflects actual vaccine temperatures is critical for protecting your vaccines. Investing in a reliable device is less expensive than replacing the vaccines wasted due to the loss of potency that comes from storage at out-of-range temperatures. CDC recommends a specific type of temperature measuring device called a digital data logger, or DDL. A DDL provides the most accurate storage unit temperature information, including details on how long a unit has been operating outside the recommended temperature range, referred to as a temperature excursion. Unlike a simple minimum-maximum thermometer, which only shows the coldest and warmest temperatures reached in a unit, a DDL provides detailed information on all temperatures recorded at preset intervals. A backup device should be readily available for emergency vaccine transport or when primary data logger is sent in for calibration. In order to prevent inadvertent exposure to out-of-range temperatures, vaccines should never be redistributed beyond the manufacturer or distributor to clinic distribution chain. In the event of necessary vaccine transport, for example, during an emergency or power outage, vaccines must be packaged following CDC recommendations and include temperature monitoring devices during transport. Please note that for VFC providers, approval is required prior to any vaccine transfer. For more information on vaccine storage and handling, contact eziz.org or cdc.gov vaccines. Added as a critical element, no pre-filling of syringes during a day-to-day -day practice is allowed. In the rare times of a community vaccine campaign such as a flu clinic, up to 10 syringes may be pre-filled if the sole purpose is to administer a single vaccine on a single day. In this instance, the person pre-filling the syringes must be the same person administering the vaccine to the member. All unused pre-fill syringes at the end of the day must be discarded. An immunization registry is required, whether your medical facility offers immunization or not. It is required that you register and have access to an immunization registry. There are two types of registries, county and state. 
The California Immunization Registry is known as CARE and is available to every facility for registration. Some areas have or had a local county registry. The county-run registries have partnered with CARE and have become CARE2. Some EMR systems also have a relationship with CARE and automatic reporting takes place as import and export. As members are establishing care with your facility, it is important to confirm with the care registry what immunizations the member has previously received. When or if your facility provides an immunization, care must be updated. Practices who refer adult members to the pharmacy for immunizations, proof of immunization is required to be entered into the member's chart. When a member obtains routine immunizations from their local pharmacy, such as annual flu, pneumonia, Shinrex, or other immunizations not requiring a prescription or primary care provider approval, all pharmacies must report to the Contractor Service Area Registry. The PCP then has an account to access the statewide immunization information system and will know if and when the member received preventive immunizations. As an example, San Diego's registry known as SDIR has partnered with CARE. This is a sample of what it would look like after you register with an example of services and resources. CARE2 has many services in each county. This is an example of how CARE2 may be of value and resources. Let's continue with Section 5 of the tool, Preventive Services. Along with the nine other elements in this section, a pure tone air conduction audiometer has been updated and must be in a quiet location for testing. All pediatric facilities are required to start audiometric testing with the four-year-old well-child visit and follow the American Academy of Pediatrics AAP periodicity guidelines. It is important that the equipment used meets industry standards. PCP offices such as family practitioners or general practitioners that refer all members to another provider for audiometric testing must have a system in place that clearly demonstrates that the PCP office verifies that audiometric testing has been completed and that those results are returned to the PCP for review. We have reached the final section of the tool, Section 6, Infection Control. There are two critical elements that have been added. Changes to cold chemical sterilant standards include staff's ability to demonstrate or verbalize the necessary steps or process to ensure sterility and appropriate PPE is available with an exposure control plan and manufacturer's recommendations for cleanup in the event of a cold chemical sterilant spill. Cold chemical high-level disinfection sterilization should only be used for instruments designed for reuse that are sensitive to heat sterilization units, such as autoclaving, steam, or pressure sterilization. Practices using cold chemical disinfection sterilization for the heat-sensitive reusable instruments. The following are procedures to follow. All chemicals come with material safety data sheets called MSDS. These instructions are to follow to prevent and reduce exposure to these harsh chemicals. Always use with caution and according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Always know the dilution ratios and expiration of diluted solution if applicable. Mark storage vessel with expiration of solution being used and change solution within the stated time frame. Use PPE to avoid inhalation and skin contact when mixing solutions. Staff should attend training classes in safety awareness of use and exposure to a sterilant. Training sessions should include proper use of sterilant, recognizing signs and symptoms of exposure such as throat and lung irritation, breathing difficulty, nose irritation, nose bleed, burning eyes and conjunctivitis, rash, hives, headaches and nausea. Staff using a sterilant must be aware of certain procedures such as cleanup procedures. These cleanup procedures include wearing appropriate PPE to include gloves and aprons made of nitrile or butyl rubber, goggles, and face shields. 
To reduce exposure and provide safety for staff exposed to harsh chemicals, an exhaust ventilation system is recommended. Keep gluter aldehyde baths under the fume hood where possible and avoiding skin contact are best practices. Using only enough sterilant to perform the desired outcome is important and always keep the holding vessel of the sterilant sealed or covered. Adhering to these procedures will ensure safety for your staff and members. If you find yourself in a PPE shortage, please refer to the Health and Human Services Agency who can provide support in obtaining proper PPE. Please request supplies by emailing the link provided or contact your MCP for assistance. As stated in the previous slides, autoclave steam sterilizing is the preferred method of sterilizing reusable instruments. In using an autoclave, there are some standards to adhere to. Spore testing of an autoclave steam sterilizer must be performed at least monthly with documented results kept on site. Even if the unit is not used monthly, Autoclave steam sterilization offers three methods of monitoring the sterilization process. Autoclave is maintained and serviced according to the manufacturer guidelines. A written operating procedure for use and care of the autoclave must be available on site. Using a load run log of each sterilized load is mandatory. This log should include date, time, and duration of run cycle temperature and steam pressure, as well as the staff member running the load. This added critical element is for management of positive mechanical, chemical, and or biological indicators of the sterilization process. This process includes the following. Mechanical, which is time, temperature, and pressure in the sterilizer. Chemical, which is internal and external indicator on the package suggests that the sterilizer was functioning properly. And biological, which is spore testing of an autoclave steam sterilizer this must be performed at least monthly with documented results kept on site, even if the unit is not used monthly. Here we have a job aid to better explain and clarify the steps and flow of spore testing. For a printable copy of this diagram and the entire presentation, please contact your MCP. This new standard states that staff should be able to verbalize to a reviewer the site's process in the event of a failed spore test. The five R's are identified here. Report a problem. Repair the unit by either sending it out, having a technician come to the facility, or replacing the unit. Retrieve. Identify the date of the last negative spore testing. Remove those instruments sterilized in the faulty unit and pull out of stock. Retest. After the unit is repaired or replaced and a valid retest shows a negative spore test, re-sterilize those instruments previously pulled out of stock. When re-sterilization occurs, follow the same standards as original sterilization parameters, such as correct packaging, and document on your load run log. Labeling packages and storing instruments in a separate, clean, dry labeled area, a cabinet, or a drawer. The next two items have not changed. However, sterility is important and must be addressed. As a reminder, when documenting on the sterilized packages, please make sure to include the date of sterilization, load run identification, and the package content. If sets of instruments are being sterilized, provide a master list of the set content, such as suture set. When a master list of instruments in a set is identified, then labeling the packages with the name of the set is sufficient, such as suture set. The second reminder is related to storage of sterilized packages. Storage areas for sterilized packages are clean, dry, and separated from non-sterile items by a functional barrier. For example, a shelf, cabinet door, and drawer. Important tips are as follows. Maintenance of sterility is event-related, not time-related. Sterilized items are considered sterile until use, unless an event causes contamination. Sterilized items are not considered sterile if the package is opened, wet, moist, discolored, or damaged, and should be removed from the sterile package storage area. And finally, 
sites should have a process for the routine inspection of sterilized packages. This concludes the sections of the Facility Site Review Tool. However, we would like to inform you that potential conflicts may arise among various agencies within the government that have different standards than DHCS. Though we all strive to collaborate to provide consistent information, standards of other agencies may differ from what your MCP site reviewer has shared with you. In the event of conflicting information, please contact your MCP's reviewer for clarification. Here are some of the resources related to the FSR component. The complete list will be in the medical record component of this training series. At the completion of the site review, your reviewer will discuss the facility scores with the designee from your facility along with the scores. The reviewer will advise you of any critical element deficiencies, facility deficiencies, and timeframes required for completion. These are called corrective action plans or CAPS. DHCS has provided each MCP very strict timelines to follow. In the table, the scoring modality has not changed. However, a component has been added called failed. For sites scoring 79% or below, MCPs will have defined policies on how to handle subsequent review frequency, which may include annual full scope reviews. Member panels will be closed until caps are completed and verified. If a site has three consecutive failed reviews, the site will be removed from all collaborating MCP networks. So now that you may understand how we score and when a cap may be required, let's discuss what types of caps may be issued. The first one is a critical element cap. These are considered life-threatening deficiencies and will be discussed before the reviewer leaves the facility. The facility cap is anything outside a critical element. These are not as crucial, but still need your attention to rectify the deficiency within the facility. Finally, we have medical record caps. This cap will only have deficiencies identified while performing the medical records review. Now some pertinent information about critical element caps and timelines. There are 14 critical elements in the new standards. If the facility is deficient in one or more critical elements, it must be corrected within 10 calendar days from date of review. An on-site CE cap verification must be performed within 30 calendar days from date of review. Please be aware, the CE on-site verification process may be carried out by a different reviewer within the MCP or a collaborative partner in the same county. FSR caps are separated from CE caps. The reviewer has 10 calendar days to report the findings for the FSR non-critical elements and provide the facility with a written cap. Once the cap is provided to the facility, all deficiencies with evidence of corrections must be submitted to the MCP within 30 calendar days. An MRR cap works the same way as the FSR cap. The reviewer has 10 calendar days to report findings and provide a written cap to the facility. The MRR cap is due within 30 calendar days of the date reported to the facility with evidence of correction. All caps may be submitted via email, fax, or postal mail. DHCS has made some updates via All Plan Letter 20-006 that has been referred to throughout this training. Here are the changes. How DHCS will be monitoring the MCP. How the MCP may monitor the facility. How to remain in the MCP network. Provider appeals process. Just as an MCP is assigned to provide your facility with the highest level of quality, all MCPs are also given guidance from DHCS to improve our quality. This is done by DHCS conducting separate site reviews to validate the MCPs, FSR, MRR processes. As part of the monitoring in the MCP, your facility may be chosen by DHCS to visit. A full review will be performed by DHCS and if required, a cap will be submitted. At this point, the MCP will contact the facility and provide the cap. The MCP will work with the site to complete the cap within the same timelines discussed previously. 
the MCPs will submit the closed cap to DHCS. It is important to mention that a DHCS monitoring does not replace the periodic site review conducted by the MCP. DHCS requires that all MCPs monitor our facilities in between each regularly scheduled periodic review. An interim review process consisting of the 14 critical elements has been established. It is up to each MCP to decide their interim review process. An interim review can be on-site or on a self-assessment form. In either delivery system, on-site or a self-assessment form, a cap will be issued for any critical element deficiencies identified and must follow the same CE cap timeline. Unannounced on-site visits may be conducted at the facility in conjunction with other medical surveys or as a part of an unannounced inspection program. Remaining in the network is very simple. Allow your MCP's reviewer to complete the FSR MRR review within every 36 months. Correct any identified deficiencies within the stated time frame discussed in this training. In the event of extenuating circumstances that a cap cannot be completed, verified, and closed within the time frame, contact the MCP with a written request for an extension. DHCS must approve extensions and must be extenuating circumstances. Pass FSR, MRR with at least an 80% compliant rate. There is no longer an appeals process in APL 20-006 allowing providers to appeal the termination from an MCP's network when a provider facility is not meeting requirements. There is a reapplication process within each MCP that will determine the time frame as to when a reapplication will be accepted. For questions, please consult your MCP for guidance. Now some tips for success. MCPs value your commitment to our members and consider you a valuable partner. Please communicate any remodeling, relocations, and additional locations to your practice as soon as the information is known to eliminate any last-minute discoveries during the audit to make the survey process more efficient. In counties with multiple MCPs, scores are shared with collaborative partners. These counties had developed memorandums of understandings approved by DHCS. By assigning one MCP to your facility through the collaboration will eliminate the need for multiple site reviews while giving one point of contact for questions and guidance and provide clarity to the process. MCPs may partner with one another to conduct joint reviews to assist our PCP sites. Most importantly, this training and all the MCPs in California have been designed for you and your facility's success. This training would not be complete without mentioning COVID-19. The following is a short update as we know it to be today. DHCS has released APL 20-011 in response to COVID-19. The following slides will explain this executive order. As of April 24, 2020, all on-site reviews have been suspended for the protection of you, your staff, your members, and your reviewers. All on-site CE verifications have been suspended and will be done via virtual process or by email, fax, or mail-in submissions. A revision as of June 12, 2020 states the APL 20-006 has been postponed until the governor lifts the public health emergency. Your MCP will keep you informed as appropriate. DHCS is allowing each MCP to develop a virtual review process based on staff, time, resource, and internet capabilities. Each MCP will work with our assigned facilities. Your MCP may ask your facility to participate in a Zoom, WebEx, or other video conference platforms. These type of platforms will allow the MCP to conduct virtual facility site reviews, verify critical element corrective action plans by conducting staff interviews, and navigate around your clinic through one of the video conference platforms mentioned. MCPs may request policies and procedures, evidence of staff trainings, licenses, and certain logs such as cleaning, grievance logs, and referral logs to be electronically submitted prior to the audit. Please, 
never send members PHI. MCPs may provide education and technical support as needed. This completes the training module for the facility site review. Thank you for your attention and remember, the MCP's success is only as good as your success. Thank you for being part of our networks and giving each member the highest quality of care possible. If you have any questions regarding any topics discussed in this training, please contact your assigned MCP.